Hi, everybody, and welcome to today's edition of the Seven Investing podcast. I'm Luke Hallard, lead advisor at Seven Investing, where it's our mission to empower you to invest in your future. We do that by providing monthly stock recommendations for our premium members and educational content that's freely available to everybody. I'm joined on the podcast this week by Neil Shelton, Chief Strategy Officer for GXO Logistics, which trades on the New York Stock Exchange under the ticker GXO. GXO are a global contract logistics company who provide outsourced supply chain management and warehousing for some of the biggest names in retail, companies like Abercrombie & Fitch, ASOS, Nestle, Saks, Salomon, Zara, and many more. My guest Neil joined GXO when they were founded just 10 short months ago, but he's got 25 years of experience in the finance industry with many notable global banks where he's led their research teams to number one rankings. Neil, welcome to the Seven Investing podcast. Luke, thank you so much for inviting us. Now, Neil, uh, I know GXO are a pretty young company, but I gather you've had the news just this week that you've been added to the Fortune 500 list. Congratulations on that. Perhaps we could start there and you could tell us a little bit about what GXO do and particularly you in your role as Chief Strategy Officer. Well, many thanks for the introduction, Luke. Um, and yes, it's an absolute pleasure to be added to that Fortune 500 list, uh, as you say. So shortly after our spin uh, from August of last year, what does GXO do? Um, uh, we provide warehousing solutions for our customers. And at heart, what we do is we try to solve problems for those customers. Our customers are heavily weighted towards uh, consumer type markets. And the problems that they face is trying to grow, I mean, an awful lot of our customer base, as you highlighted uh, uh, earlier, um, they're growth type businesses. They're wrestling with growth in the e-commerce channel. They're trying to grow more efficiently. They're trying to grow and better use their own resources, notably inventory. As the e-commerce channel proliferates, it's a much more complicated warehousing type activity relative to wholesale or brick and mortar. And that's what we're helping to solve for. So we have invested heavily in technology, both automation and software, in order to help drive solutions for our customers. We have the benefits of scale, operating uh, over 900 warehouses globally, which gives us an advantage in being able to source labor uh, for our customers. And all of that is helping to drive, if you like, great opportunities. We're seeing growth opportunities from first time outsourcing. We're seeing great growth opportunities from customers needing help to move into that e-commerce channel. And we're also, as you can imagine in this current environment, seeing a lot of growth opportunities from customers saying, I need a more strategic fix. I need to embrace technology, embrace automation, given labor inflation that you're seeing characterized around many markets today. Absolutely. And I've I've heard GSO described as one of the biggest companies you've never heard of. You know, this sort of invisible glue behind the scenes that really helps keep e-commerce um, active. And, you know, clearly, as you said, that's a massively growing market. There's still, I gather, quite low overall penetration of e-commerce as a, as a relative to all commerce. So, you know, clearly a, a really growing industry. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're working with many customers who are planning for a significantly higher than 50% direct-to-consumer or e-commerce type share from what is in generally across most markets kind of 20 to 30 percent today and and that's giving great opportunities to expand dedicated facilities but also uh, some co-tenanted facilities multi-use facilities going forward um, as everybody wants to have a best in class consumer experience and as you highlight we're behind the scenes helping to deliver that to our customers but not only a great consumer experience but our solutions are driving a significant improvement in their margins uh, and indeed their growth going forward. Fantastic. Look, looking forward to getting into the details of GXO. So b- before we do that, though, I wonder, because you have I think you've probably got a really interesting perspective on what's happening in the world at large. And I wonder if we could sort of start there, because there's some probably some great insights for seven investing listeners. If I look at how my own stock portfolio has really been decimated in the last six months, there seem to be kind of three major factors that have impacted the stock market and particularly e-commerce companies. And I suppose those are things like supply chain challenges, which I guess are still ongoing, um, rising inflation, which might be impacting consumer discretionary spending, uh, and then also the conflict in Eastern Europe. Um, And as a company who are helping other companies manage their supply chains, I wonder if you guys have a quite an interesting perhaps 
forward looking view on these problems and how they're kind of shaking out. And maybe crucially, if you're seeing any signs in your data of when we might get back to business as usual. I mean, it's, it's a fantastic question in terms of business as usual, because uh, uh, there's clearly, clearly been numerous shocks to the supply chain. Uh, looking back, you had in the second half of last year, congestion at inbound ports, most notably some of the US ports. And through the first half of this year, you've had, uh, uh, if you like, complexity in getting products out of some of the ports in, in Southeast Asia. So customers have had to wrestle with, uh, if you like, less predictability on arrival of goods and have sought, if you like, to try to strategically change that. Do we have a, a crystal ball as to when the supply chain issues may resolve? No, um, but it, it, it might be worth kind of pointing out what some of our customers are trying to achieve in terms of being able to have business as usual. Certainly through the second half of last year, we saw a dramatic reaction from especially direct to consumer brands of wanting to get their product into their end consumers hands as fast as possible and they really embraced the e-commerce or direct to consumer channel now, there are many reasons that companies are seeking to do this but it sped up that uh, uh, product ending up into the end consumer hand that allowed them to book revenues faster, gave them also at the same time a, a, a greater control over that consumer relationship. And there was a notable, if you like, shift out of wholesale retail uh, activities into direct to consumer. And to be brutally honest, we continue to see that trend going forward um, because it's the most natural reaction to question marks around the supply chain. So what, what GXO is, is, is helping to deliver is an element of predictability in that uncertain supply chain. If we can drive enormous velocity and efficiency through the warehouse, allow our customers to get the their product into the hands of consumers as fast as possible, then it's driving great growth opportunities for us. The other thing we're really seeing, Luke, is a much greater focus on returns and reverse logistics. Now, that's partly as a result of the growth of the e-commerce channel, where typically you see about 30% of what's sent out come back uh, as a return. Um, but it's also customers focusing on utilizing that stock to fulfill other customers' orders. So we're seeing, if you like, great growth opportunities coming through in that reverse logistics channel. And look, for some customers, that is 30% of inventory that they need to turn around very rapidly. And if it's dealt with in season, it can drive a much improved gross margin performance. So if you like, what we're, what we're really seeing is customers seeking to drive efficiencies, to drive velocity, and to use this for their advantage going forward in terms of a direct-to-consumer relationship. And, and look, for some of the brands we work with, you could really see that improvement in gross margin as they've pushed harder direct-to-consumer. Your second question was really in terms of inflation and are we seeing much pressure in terms of, of wallet share? The honest answer is not so far. I think a good early year in terms of weather has helped drive footfall back into uh, retail channels. But we continue to see customers planning for further e-commerce share shift over a period of time. We haven't really seen any, any uh, dramatic change uh, in consumer uh, expenditure. And then I think your final question was around what are we seeing with regards to Eastern Europe uh, and indeed Russia. Um, we don't have much in the way of operations in, the, in those uh, territories. Um, we have some customers that have exported from Europe uh, into that, but it's been a very small proportion uh, of their activity. And we traditionally work with direct to consumer type brands. There's not an awful lot of product being sourced from that region uh, that has really driven it. So relative to some other, if you like, supply chain impacts, it's, it's been certainly so far uh, much less of an impact. And maybe going back to the supply chain question, I, I'm not an expert in this area at all. I wonder if there's almost an opportunity for a logistics provider, because I guess for a, a brand that you service to be able to maintain quick delivery times, but still navigate the complex supply chains to get goods inbound from overseas, does that mean they actually have to have more inventory in your warehouses so that they can sort of service their consumer demand? Actually, Luke, it's quite the opposite. I mean, one of the main benefits that we bring to our customers is reducing the inventory or working capital tied up into their into their businesses. So, I mean, if I, I was at a, a e-commerce site um, two weeks ago, uh, big direct-to-consumer uh, activity. 
And what we've done with that site is that we've basically, since the period we've been working with this company, and it's a good long-term relationship, um, we've taken the number of SKUs that they offer to their customers up from about 300,000 to circa 800,000. So if you like, help them to grow their business just by offering much more choice to the customer. But over that period of time, we've held the inventory to sales flat. So if you like, that inventory per SKU has more than halved, which is really important. I mean, for every retailer or direct to consumer brand, there is always quite a degree of seasonality. And typically to clear that end of season stock, you, I don't know, halve the price uh, of the product. So if a, uh, typically a retailer is 30% overstocked and you're having to half the price, that's 15% of gross margin points of pressure. If we're more than halving that, we're giving the customer close to 10% added back gross margin. And that's why, if you like, outsourced warehousing is becoming a source of competitive advantage mm-hmm. and helping customers to embrace that e-commerce channel because they can, they can reinvest in a better consumer delivery proposition, more marketing, pricing if they choose, um, and all of which is, is, if you like, helping us to show how we're delivering really quite outsized benefits to customers. Warehousing, to put it in context, is typically 2 to 6% of total product cost. We're a few tens of basis points, but if we're delivering just on the gross margin side through inventory turn, that sort of benefit, we, it, it's, it, you can see why we're seeing such great growth opportunities ahead of ourselves. That's great. And, you know, it allows the retailer to focus on what they're best at and engage with strong partners to do what they're best at. And in this case, you know, GXO is a leader in logistics. Mm. What are the typical logistic models that your customers could use if they want to start scaling up to national or international delivery? So, I mean, the core of what we do, Luke, is, is really standing up large scale bespoke solutions for kind of global blue chip type brands. And those solutions help customers grow, especially into the e-commerce channel, which is complex. I mean, if you think about the route of moving from brick and mortar or wholesale to e-commerce, you're, you're, you're dealing with, let's say, a pallet of 10,000 white t-shirts turns up from Southeast Asia in a wholesale model. That 10,000 white t-shirts would be shipped onto somewhere else. In a retail model, it would probably get mixed with a thousand red, yellow, blue, green t-shirts and and go out to another store. In the world of e-commerce, those thousand t-shirts are going out as a thousand different packages to the consumer, but will be mixed with one or two other of hundreds of thousands of SKUs where the consumer expects it same day, next day. And so an awful lot of activity into the warehouse for uh, our customers in the e-commerce channel. So uh, we solve for helping customers to grow into that incredibly complex e-commerce channel. And look, if you were to assume an e-commerce unit is five to 10 times the amount of work of a wholesale type activity, that probably gives you some indication of, of, of what we do. We're also helping to solve our customers in terms of, if you like, reducing their over, over manufacturing. So go back to that e-commerce example, actually reducing the inventory per SKU, and then also dealing with returns helps to reduce the, if you like, over capacity of, of, of manufacture uh, for them. We're also helping to reduce wastage. In many instances, that's just by driving up the velocity uh, of the warehouse. Um, I was uh, at a site last week which has a 99.99% precision ratio, and it's for the consumer packaged goods customer that we put that in. That's helped to reduce their wastage by over 60%. So yes, we've delivered huge efficiency savings from the automation we've put in place. Variable cost per unit has dropped by 80%. But this is a very consumer and ESG focused customer, reducing that wastage by 60%. What is wastage in the context of logistics? In in the case of consumer packaged goods, it's it's ensuring that you don't have goods returned to you. So if it's shipped to a re, to a, a a supermarket, that it, if it's if it's wrong, the supermarket just won't accept it. It'll be shipped back and it'll be historically scrapped. Or you have product which is just going through its sell by date. So that's different from um, sort of reverse logistics, where consumers are receiving the thing they ordered, but they've changed their mind and they're sending it back. And I gather that's a quite a, a large proportion of, of uh, you know, the total orders that go out. So this is more uh, sort of lost goods because of sell-by dates and things like that. Yes, I mean, a, a wrong order being sent out to a yeah. supermarket. Yeah. 
uh, as you can imagine, supermarkets uh, are not minded to accept something that's wrong. And well, the easiest thing for them to do is just to send it straight back. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so we talked there a little bit about uh, what GX do as a outsourcing logistics providers, and and you've talked about some of the benefits for your customers. Um, and one thing we talked about prior to recording was some of the ESG measures, sort of environmental measures that that you help with. Could you describe some of those a little bit? Sure. I mean, we recently published our first ESG report, and we were absolutely thrilled to highlight within it that we've reduced our greenhouse gas intensity, so measured as a dollar of revenue, um, by 24% over the past year. And that shows that we're, if you like, just delivering more with less in terms of the resources that we're using. Um, and look, at the heart of what we do, we are seeking to reduce manufacture over capacity. If you consider the loop that typically 50 to 80 percent of the carbon footprint of a product is in its initial manufacture and shipped destination market. If we're reducing overstocking in that e-commerce example by more than 50 percent, then we're having a very significant positive effect um, on the environment. We're also increasingly uh, standing up carbon negative warehouses. Um, I was at a site just outside of Milan uh, last month, which up until Tesla turned on the Gigafactory was Europe's largest rooftop solar plant, something we were very, uh, very proud of and um, that we work with our customer there um, in order to help not only power the automation within the warehouse, but also to power the buses, taking teammates to and from the station. Uh, and also, uh, this is a two million square foot site in order to help transportation around the, around the site. So the site generates so much electricity, we're putting it back into the regional grid. Um, and as you can imagine, where companies are increasingly focused on scope three type emissions, we've got some great, if you like, technologies uh, and case studies to show where we can really improve uh, the carbon footprint for our customers. And at heart, most of our customers are in some way consumer focused. And so the consumer is very minded to if you like, work and, and put their dollars to work with companies that are doing the right thing going forward. Um, and that's one of the benefits of working with, uh, uh, with GXM. You touched there on some of the automation in the warehouses and great to hear that that's kind of being powered by that big fusion reactor in the sky. Could you tell us a little bit about some of the exciting stuff you do have in your warehouses? I've, I've seen some uh, videos of robots and all sorts of quite interesting technology. The, the industry is going through a fantastic J-curve, Luke. And whilst everybody loves seeing pictures of these huge, large-scale automated activities where once the good is off the truck, it's not touched by human hand kind of moving around. Actually, what's really exciting around the industry is kind of development along two different lines. Firstly, collaborative technology, so it's good person activities, collaborative robots, kind of modular type technology um, have an increasingly wide application. We're using them in e-commerce sites. We're starting with the deployment of large scale collaborative robots in food and, and beverage sites. So this is super exciting because it, 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 it's people working with technology. It helps to differentiate GXO. Our teammates, our associates are a real competitive advantage relative to our peers. And what we're finding is where people are working with these collaborative technologies, their sense of empowerment goes up, engagement goes up I mean, very, very significantly. But we're also driving down one of the if you like, benefits that GXO brings given our scale, which is a cycle of continuous improvement. And it's driving that down to the floor. And, and that's really important because it, it's a, a process that drives benefits for our customers, but also helps to empower the teammates. So we're seeing lots of new utility for these collaborative technologies. Um, we're in the process of deploying them across uh, a number of food and beverage sites uh, in Europe uh, to start with, which are driving great improvements for our customers, typically 50 to 80 percent efficiency benefits, improved precision because you're having, uh, you've got scanning and vision technology, you've got weighing technology as part of these collaborative technologies, and it improves the velocity, so less wastage coming through in, in food and beverage. So yes, lots of activity on the automation side, but what's also really super exciting is the software side. So now combining vastly improved vision technology, using artificial intelligence, using machine learning, we're able to 
deploy this in reverse logistics to reduce the human interaction. That's important for customers because reverse logistics is expensive. Okay, uh, you've seen some data points uh, published in the US which suggest if you include transportation costs, the average cost of a return could be north of twenty dollars. If we can drive that down in terms of the warehousing cost, we'll drive more customers wanting to reuse their product for an outbound activity, especially in lower value type items. So machine learning, artificial intelligence, great application in reverse logistics, but also too, increasingly in, if you like, packing. Um, if I were to put in front of you a car battery and a feather, Luke, you wouldn't have any problem picking them up because you'd know what sort of force and how to grip and how to put it into uh, whatever it's going to be packed into afterwards. A robotic arm doesn't understand that. So we've been developing an awful lot of technology to help drive more through the packing activity. And, and look, this is important for customers where there's been a, a sense of questionability over the cost or the availability of labor in, in some markets. Having uh, a, 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 an activity such as packing, historically quite if you like, repetitive, that can be undertaken by automation, improves the predictability of that warehouse solution. And, and at the end of the day, predictability is what our customers really look for in warehousing. As a consumer uh, and as an Amazon uh, Prime member, I've got really used to uh, getting my goods next day, even same day sometimes. Is there an end state, do you think, to consumer expectations around delivery times? Um, or are Amazon kind of driving us all to expect stuff in you know, one hour or less. But what are you guys targeting? What do you expect consumers to want as an end point? I think it'll vary significantly product by product, Luke. Um, um, we work with a, a luxury goods company um, which uh, promises three hour delivery um, from a site uh, which serves a couple, uh, a, a two major markets. Um, I, the difference between that and a piece of fast fashion in terms of price point is absolutely phenomenal. So the cost of that delivery relative to the overall product cost is, is quite insignificant. Um, I don't think uh, on a $10 order that a three hour delivery is a realistic proposition for many customers. So I think it'll vary significantly product by product. Um, there is, however, a clear trend of more and more customers wanting to drive a best-in-class consumer experience. So if a marketplace is offering same day or next day delivery, then many brands will want to at least match that same day or next day delivery. And actually they're going a bit further because they're doing 24 hour processing of returns. I mean, uh, there is a site we've, we've operated for a major global sportswear brand where when they offered same day delivery, they drove up their net promoter score by 20%. When they offered 24 hour processing of returns, it drove it up by a further 25%. So it's not just outbound in terms of speed of delivery of product into the consumer hands. It's also, mm -hmm. if I've ordered three pairs of trainers um, and I only want to keep one, that I'm gonna get the money back for those other two very, very rapidly. Um, so yeah, we're seeing, if you like, more and more companies wanting to have that best-in-class consumer experience, um, but I, I wouldn't say it's going to be ubiquitous same day. I, I don't think that works for every single product category. That makes sense. You're right. There are some things that you kind of, if you want them, you want them now, and there are some things it kind of doesn't matter so much. Um, yeah. And I suppose, you know, not so much a competitive advantage, but it could be a competitive disadvantage for a brand if they're not at least at par with their peers selling into the same industry. Yeah, I mean, your, your experience with regard to ordering on certain marketplaces is actually quite interesting to observe because what we are seeing is our customers in other verticals demand that sort of activity. I mean, a good example, um, we work with a, a number of aerospace companies who are increasingly going down the route of that if you like, in app ordering of spare parts. Now, if you've got a 747 grounded in Dubai because it needs one spare part, it needs that e commerce type velocity, precision, get it to make the delivery cutoff to earn to that 747 to get back up into the sky and earning revenues again. And, and what we're seeing is that if you like that service, level of service expectation is permeating through other verticals and not just aerospace right now. It's interesting you take us into the, the aerospace comment because 
You're absolutely right. So, and if we think about sort of come away from industry and now think about GXO specifically, I guess we've talked about kind of e-commerce stuff that we'll all be used to as consumers, but I understand your customers are in lots of different industry verticals. Could you bring that to life a little bit? You know, what do you actually do for aerospace, for example? It's uh, largely spare parts uh, mm -hmm. and also parts to in the construction of uh, uh, new uh, aircraft. Um, as you can imagine, when you're building a, uh, a, a let's say a, a commercial airliner you don't you can't have all the parts lying around at one go but they've got to arrive at the right time so that everything can be connected together and, and, and to uh, help finish the uh, overall product and, and similarly for uh, both airlines and the OEMs we are providing a parts uh, replacement survey but the service and, and the same is true across electronics so if you look across GXO as a whole about 50 percent of our revenues come through from what we call uh, e-commerce, omnichannel, and consumer technology. So very online focused activities. And then we have just under 15% each coming through from consumer packaged goods um, and food, and, and then also uh, kind of food and beverage uh, activities. Uh, the remaining roughly quarter of our revenues comes through uh, from a, a mix of other activities, which includes aerospace. We also work with some uh, chemicals companies and others that are, if you like, seeking to take advantage of, of, of the benefits of outsourcing. And, and on the website, you describe uh, management, sorry, manufacturing support services that you offer to some of these classes of customers. What, what kind of thing happens within the warehouse where a customer is using those capabilities? So one of the interesting trends that we're seeing, and I guess it's back down to your question around the kind of uh, uh, marketplace consumer experience is that we're seeing a, a lot of late stage, almost manufacturing type activity coming back into the warehouse. Uh, me, let me give you an example. If you were to order a personalized product, you would want that personalized product about the same delivery timetable as a non-personalized product. And so instead of that being done at source of manufacture, that is now coming back into our warehouse so that the customer we're working with, who's clearly going to be charging more for the personalized product, won't have the consumer say, oh, I'm not prepared to wait three weeks for that. Um, I can get it the same day, next day, two days later, whatever it may be, uh, compared to the standard delivery uh, timetable. So that's the sort of thing we're seeing come, if you like, into the warehouse. And, and look, it's, it's helping to drive growth for our customers. It's clearly value add for us. It's within our warehouse and um, it's, it's a good high margin activity because we're really delivering further value to our customers. Is it really the GXO team performing some of the manufacturing steps in the process, or it's more that you integrate with the manufacturer themselves and there's kind of handoffs and handbacks? When it comes to personalization, uh, Luke is us doing it. Um, mm. It's our warehouse, it's our staff, and in many instances, it's our processes and technologies that are uh, uh, undertaking this. And, and look, we're fortunate to work with some great customers consumer electronics, in luxury goods, uh, and in entertainment, uh, where we provide these personalization uh, services. And it's going to become more pervasive. I mean, it, it, even in a world of fast fashion now, you're seeing growth in personalization um, because it drives consumer engagement. Very good. Very, very impressive. Um, so are there other ways in which GXO help retail customers grow their businesses? Uh, I mean, at, at heart, what we're doing is we always try to solve for a problem for our customers. And inevitably, it's wrestling with that e-commerce, complex, high-velocity solution. I mean, to put it in context, Luke, we had sites that through the uh, Thanksgiving weekend did significantly more than half a million outbound e-commerce units per day. So when you consider the amount of stock required of many hundreds of thousands of SKUs to arrive at a packing station at the right time to meet a never foreshortening delivery timetable. That's where we drive the, huge, the, the, the biggest value for our customers. So helping them to grow from historically wholesale and brick and mortar into e-commerce. But importantly, it's that inventory management process we, we discussed a little earlier, where we can drive significantly lower inventory holding per SKU to improve gross margins, to allow them to make the e-commerce channel their most profitable channel and to provide a differentiated customer service that we're really helping to solve for. Yes, we can drive further benefits, 
reduction in carbon footprint, reduction in over manufacturing capacity, and importantly, too, dealing with reverse logistics, which is, uh, if you like, a bit of a byproduct of that e-commerce channel share shift. But at heart, what we do is help customers grow efficiently, both in terms of operating costs and also in terms of, of inventory management. I was um, at one very large UK brand that you'll be aware of. Once we took over their e-commerce operations, we dropped the operating cost per e-commerce unit by 80%. We drove up the velocity of their outbound e-commerce activities by a factor of six. And this company recently came up with a, a trading update and, and highlighted that their percentage of full price sales is up very, very sharply over time. And, and that, that's the inventory management process. That's great. That's, that's great for consumers and great for these brands to help them scale and compete with an Amazon that, you know, has this enormous infrastructure. But I guess when you're a retailer, if you do a deal with Amazon, you're kind of doing a deal with the devil a little bit. So it's nice to have other independent options. We're often seen as the uh, uh, unconflicted third party logistics business. We, we don't have trucking operations. We don't have freight operations. We focus on everything within the warehouse and we help our customers have a best in class consumer experience. And, and, and clearly the company that you mentioned has helped drive that consumer expectation. So we've, um, we've touched on reverse logistics a couple of times, and I think you've recently, or you're in the process of making an acquisition of a firm called Clipper Logistics to help with reverse logistics. So who are, what are Clipper all about and how are they uh, additive to your capability in that area? Well, we're pretty excited by uh, uh, Clipper. Um, we've received uh, uh, the shareholder approval for the transaction. Um, we've held it, uh, we've closed the transaction and the company will be held separate until we receive regulatory uh, approval, which we hope to come through uh, over the course uh, of the summer. Clipper is an incredibly innovative growth company. I mean, it, it, it's a great cultural fit with GXO. And one of the parts of Clipper, and there are many things that we're super excited about with this business, is that Clipper has a, if you like, best in class repairs activity. Um, when you consider, Luke, across many sectors, about 25% of what gets returned to a brand, retailer, whoever it may be, gets put into landfill. Clipper solves for that. Um, they've got a, a best-in-class OEM or consumer electronics OEM repair business. They're an accredited repairer. They repair and send the product out with warranty to customers. So diverting away from landfill, but importantly for their customers, really utilizing that return inventory so much better. So helpful to gross margin, helpful in that case of inventory type, that would be, if you like, being less certain to get hold of going forward. And we're super excited about expanding that across our customers. We work with a number of telecoms companies in Europe and the US. We work with a number of consumer technology companies, again, across our footprint, electrical retailers. And for them to better use the inventory, reduce that landfill, it's important. And, and that's just one of the things that we're looking to grow with Clipper uh, uh, going forward. Clipper are a British company, are they? Yes, but excitingly for us, it helps to bring us critical mass in Germany. Uh, mm. So Germany is Europe's largest uh, 3PL market, and we've got a, a relatively light footprint in Germany. Clipper brings us, us critical mass. And look, if you look at GXO as a whole, across our top 20 customers, they work with us on average in three countries, um, not in Germany. We're super excited by the fact that Clipper will bring us critical mass and we'll be able to, if you like, further push on our land and expand strategy. So we're very fortunate to work with some great global blue chip companies and we're looking forward to expanding that relationship uh, into, into Germany. Um, and also Clipper brings us access to new verticals. Pharmaceutical and life sciences is an area that we think are e-commerce solutions that will apply very well to them. I mean, increasingly, it's a direct-to-consumer type business, requires amazing precision, requires high velocity, and we're super ex uh, excited about uh, taking Clipper's vertical expertise and growing that our footprint. I mean, and, and to give you some sort of, of context uh, around that, we, we acquired a business back in very early 2001 uh, in the UK, which, which brought three areas of vertical expertise, telecoms, technology, and food and beverage. Um, it, it, we acquired about $600 million of revenues. 
in the contracts that we've publicly announced, um, Curry's BT, for example, um, we have taken that vertical expertise and already grown the overall revenue base by well over 20% from the new contracts that, that we've won. And, and that's the exciting opportunity with Clipper. Um, they're a fantastic business and will really look to accelerate their growth around our global footprint. That's fantastic. And good to see a bit of British innovation there, uh, you know, rolling out more widely under the GXO umbrella. I think that's great. Uh, you know, you mentioned that, uh, you know, you've been around for a long time. I guess we didn't really say in the intro and I, and I intro GXO as being just a 10 month old company, but maybe you could give a little bit of insight just into the history there because you were spun out of a company that had a much longer legacy. Yeah, so we spun out of uh, XPO in early August of last year. Um, mm. Uh, and we're the contract logistics part of uh, XPO. So there was a, a good argument uh, to highlight that there was track equity value within the conglomerate structure of XPO. And indeed, this has given us the opportunity to highlight the GXO story. I mean, you, you start off by saying it's kind of one of the uh, larger businesses that you've never heard of. And that was clearly the case when we were trapped inside this conglomerate structure. Right. And also, this has given us the great opportunity to highlight the benefits we can bring to our customers. So if you look at like the operational performance post spin of GXO. Um, we've announced record wins in the fourth quarter, record wins in the first quarter. We won contracts of the lifetime value of 2 billion. Our sales pipeline is at an all time high at 2.5 billion exiting the first quarter. It, it, it's clear that that spin process has also helped us, uh, if you like, to carve out more of a unconflicted best in class technologically savvy, but also driving huge benefits for customers story that, that resonates. Not being part of a bigger conglomerate has clearly so far really helped the GXO uh, uh, case. Very good. So if I, if I asked you to pick on maybe the one thing you're most proud of, maybe in that, that short GXO uh, history, what would you point out? We, we've touched on the fantastic wins that we've continued to back. So we've won contracts uh, uh, up until the end of the first quarter that will have a, a, a positive $1 billion revenue impact in 2022. And we've won further contracts that will drive us forward in, in 2023. But I think, too, we had a, a brief touch on ESG. So we published our first ESG report uh, last month. And that's important. It, it highlighted the benefits that we're bringing to our customers. Customers are signing long-term contracts with GXO, so we, we, there's, a, there's a very deep partnership. And, uh, and as you can see from that top 20 customers working across three countries, it's an expanding and deepening partnership. So being the if like partner of choice and highlighting the journey that we're making on our targets going forward is really important. And I think is a, is a differentiating factor. I mean, we're in a we're in a very fragmented industry. It's about 430 billion dollar addressable market, 130 billion is outsourced. We've got about a 5% share of that. So we're only 2% share of what is currently uh, uh, addressable for us. And working with long duration contracts, it's important to, have, to look like the right partner, to be financially stable. We've highlighted that post spin, to share the if you like, operating best in class expectations for our customers. And that ESG report, I think, is very exciting to highlight the journey of doing great business in the right way that we're seeking to do at GXA. That's a, that's a fantastic. And you, you almost got 10 things there, but I'll let you off with the, the wrap up on the I ESG. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, Neil, that was a really fascinating discussion. And, you know, hopefully seven investing listeners understand a little bit more about outsourced logistics and how critical the capability is to many of the companies that are probably in their portfolios today. And I definitely feel more informed about some of the challenges in the world and how GXO are helping um, helping retailers overcome those. So thanks, thanks a lot for sharing your perspective with our listeners today. Luke, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for having us on your podcast. Fabulous. Well, guys, you've been listening to the Seven Investing podcast, where it's our goal to empower you to invest in your future. If you want to know more, swing by seveninvesting.com slash subscribe. We've got a fantastic deal on your first month of membership right now, which will give you access to our deep repository of over 100 stock recommendations, deep dive videos and regular company updates. Thanks, everybody.